Alright, time to go back to the late 90s for one of the best games ever made. And I still remember first being introduced to this game through a demo CD I got from a video game magazine. Yes, PlayStation demos were actually a thing. And just the demo itself was already something I've never experienced in a game before. So when the complete game came out, it blew my fucking balls out of my pants from sheer absolute all-encompassing awesomeness. So that was back then, but does the game still hold up today? Yes. Does it still have the same impact as it had back then? Nah, I wouldn't say so. Some aspects of it feel a little bit archaic, but that ultimately doesn't detract from what an absolute classic this game is. And as you might expect, the gameplay is at its best on the highest difficulty setting. So in this walkthrough, I'm going to guide you through the game on extreme difficulty. I also have a Metal Gear Solid 2 European Extreme walkthrough on my channel and I don't quite recall the difference between Extreme and European Extreme mode in that game, but what I can say is that European Extreme difficulty in MGS2 is a lot harder than Extreme difficulty in Metal Gear Solid 1. Regardless, we're still dealing with a quite unforgiving challenge and that's mainly because there is almost no opportunity for you to heal any damage you take. Unlike on hard mode or below, Rations can no longer be found as regular items. For example, here in the starting area, behind the forklift is usually where you pick up the first ration. But it won't be there, nor anywhere else in the game. The only way to get rations is as a random drop from a killed enemy. And even then, you can only carry one at a time. And on top of that, there are only three times in the game when your life bar is automatically refilled. Namely, when you are captured mid-game, uh, before the final fight with Liquid on top of Metal Gear, and directly after that when the escape route section begins. Now, unlike MGS2, the game doesn't automatically end when you are spotted, but I actually prefer the game to be that way, so I will not allow myself to get uh, through unrequired alert states. And to add some extra challenge, I will also not allow myself to needlessly kill any regular enemies during the standard sneaking sections. So complete stealth for those parts of the game. However, that does mean, well, since I just mentioned that rations only randomly drop from killed enemies, I ended up with only having 3 rations for the entire playthrough. So even though most attacks in this game don't even hit all that hard on extreme difficulty, it's not so much that you take much more damage, but it's a matter of uh, having to take your health very seriously, as you will be feeling the consequences of each hit you take for a very long time. Now as you know, over half the game consists of cutscenes and codec calls, but I will not be focusing that much on the story. It's also not purely gameplay, but there will be lots and lots of skips, and I will also leave things out like uh, backtracking for the PSG1, uh, the torture section, and the whole shape memory alloy sequence near the end of the game. Well, to be fair, even if I had wanted to, I guess my game is just too old, because it doesn't function as it used to. There are frame skips, audio glitches and blurry visuals at certain points, but those mostly occur during cutscenes, so those won't be getting in the way of the actual gameplay, fortunately. I guess it's just that the game was made with currently existing technology. Well, currently back then. I, I have no idea where I'm going with this. Anyway, the game doesn't start off by throwing you into the deep end, uh, you won't be encountering much trouble yet. However, if you attempt extreme mode directly from normal mode, then the absence of the Soliton radar will be a tough pill to swallow, especially because of the camera angle. 
this uh, top-down perspective is definitely not always that well suited for this kind of gameplay. So you will need to rely a lot more on first-person view and pressing up against walls to make the camera angle change. Or something that works especially well in smaller areas, you can literally memorize how the soldiers move. Because when you enter a new area, the guards will always have the same starting position and then follow a specific route. So that means that we're dealing with a learnable pattern. So at times you will see me running through areas without paying much attention to the guards at all. Now, when it comes to which ventilation duct you go through at the start, doesn't really matter. But the reason I always go through the top one is, uh, well, first of all, out of habit. But uh, you want to be on the upper walkway of the next area anyway, in order to get the thermal goggles. Because if you don't get them, before going to the DARPA chief, that room will be locked and you cannot enter until you have uh, security card level 4. So regardless of which duct you go through, you are definitely better off picking up the thermal goggles because those come in handy multiple times before you get back here with the right security card. I take it that pretty much everyone was able to figure out that you can hide directly underneath surveillance cameras. Uh, you can always use chaff grenades of course, but you don't want to just needlessly waste them either. There are only two guards around to the tanks on the bottom floor, but you have to be careful when you're going down the stairs. Try to first find out where the left soldier is, using first person view mode if necessary, because you need to time going down the stairs when the camera is facing straight down, or ahead. It's, it's a bit awkward to talk about direction because of the top down perspective. Also there's a little trick that you can do with the elevator. Since it's possible that you get spotted when waiting for the elevator to come up, if you press the button twice, the elevator will immediately arrive for some reason. Normally there would be a ration in here, but as I said before, you cannot find rations at item locations, only as random drops from killed enemies. Alright, first we get to see Meryl's future husband on the toilet with his pants still on for some reason. And better make sure to pick up the ammunition beyond that, because you don't want to start the fight in a minute with only 12 bullets. Oh, and by the way, speaking of Johnny, he almost fucked up and blew Decoy Octopus's plan. You probably wondered yourself at that point why the DARPA chief could just wave a guard away like that. But what really fucked things up, of course, is that he, well, died. Okay, I'm gonna get you out of here. Wait a minute. What is it? You haven't heard any other way to disarm the pal, have you? From your bosses or anyone? No. Are you sure you haven't heard anything? I just said no. So does the White House plan to give in to the terrorist demands? That's their problem. It has nothing to do with my orders. But what about the Pentagon? Pentagon? What is it? What? A little interesting bit of trivia, if you hadn't picked up the SOCOM before, an alternate version of this cutscene will play where Snake grabs the barrel of Meryl's gun rather than drawing his own weapon.
Don't move! So you killed the chief, you bastard! Liquid? No, you're not. Don't move! Is this the first time you ever pointed a gun at a person? Your hands are shaking. <sighs> Can you shoot me, rookie? Careful. I'm no rookie. Liar. That nervous glance. That scared look in your eyes. They're rookie's eyes if I ever saw them. You've never shot a person, am I right? You talk too much. You haven't even taken the safety off, rookie. I told you I'm no rookie! <sighs> You're not one of them, are you? Open that door. You've got a card, don't you? Why? So we can get the hell out of here. Looks like we'll be a little delayed. What are you doing? Don't think. Shoot! All right, the trick to this fight is using the quick reloading trick. If you press R1 twice, you will unequip and re-equip your weapon, which will instantaneously reload it. So you won't have to go through the reloading animation which would obviously be the most dangerous times in this fight. The enemies also take a lot of shots to kill, so you really want to spam the square button. A good strategy is to position yourself next to the door. This way the soldiers have to divide their attention between you and Meryl. And in the case you happen to run out of ammo, you can run in an arch to the left side of the room, which will likely prevent you from getting hit, as the guards aim a bit like stormtroopers. And hopefully by then, Meryl have taken them out for you. Moreover, when you are next to the door, you are automatically out of range of the explosions when grenades are thrown into the room. Okay, let's first head back into the room, not to look at the Johnny's pixelated sense of ass, but to refill your ammo. And then we're going to the second floor basement, although the developers expect you to go back up to the first floor, because in the cutscene, after the fight against Revolver Ocelot, you have the suppressor attached to the SOCOM, even if you haven't acquired it yet. Well, as I said before, I try not to needlessly kill any guards, and there aren't any guards yet on the second floor basement anyway. And I actually make a mistake, because what I should have done is to also use C4 on the other breakable walls. Because about halfway through the game, I need a lot of stun grenades. And I used them a bit too much before that. So I had to break my rule of not needlessly killing guards to get stun grenades behind one of those walls, which I could have prevented if I simply had destroyed them when I had the chance. Well, anyway, the fight against Revolver Ocelot is up next, and unfortunately, he's not your actual enemy. The camera is. After all, because of the top-down perspective, you simply cannot see what you're doing. However, there are ways of dealing with that, as I will show you. Six bullets. More than enough to kill anything that moves. Now I'll show you why they call me... Revolver. Okay, just hold square to auto-aim and fire, then move left and fire straight up. Move halfway up and hold square to auto-aim again and this time you will actually see him. After this you will have to chase him around. However, keep in mind that he always stands still when he fires. When he is reloading, let him get away first, because this will make him hide behind a pillar. And that means that you can sneak up on him for a free hit. If you keep chasing him around, he will simply reload while he is running away from you. Now, what is very risky, and because I fired too late, I did in fact take a hit. But if you pay close attention to the movement of your laser when you hold down the square button, you can determine from the angle whether there's a clear line of sight between you and Ocelot, or whether there's a pillar between him and you. 
So that way you can aim at Ocelot without actually seeing him. But of course the risk is that you cannot see if he's about to fire and you have a very narrow window of opportunity to get a shot in. And the final danger is the fact that his bullets ricochet off the walls. And that adds an RNG factor as to whether you just happen to be in the line of a bouncing bullet. Okay, so after Baker died as well, we have the first point in the game where our life bar is extended. However, on other difficulties, this will also regain your life bar. But on extreme, only the max amount is increased. You don't regain anything. So let's be clear again. There is no other way to heal on extreme difficulty, except for rations. And those are only dropped by soldiers, with two exceptions. You get one from Otacon in the torture room. And you can potentially get one from the top of a crate in the second fight against Vulcan Raven. Which is very easy to miss and in fact I do not get that one. So if you also don't want to needlessly kill any guards, you have very little opportunity to heal. As I said before, I only heal 3 times in this entire playthrough. And speaking of guards, there are 2 guards present now in this area. So as I mentioned, since they move in a specific pattern and always at the same starting position when you enter an area, I am able to loot all of the lower rooms and get to the elevator without even looking at where the guards are. Because if you move like I do here, and if you are fast enough, they will be on the very left and very right side of the area when you go up to the elevator. But what does bite me in the ass later on, as I said, is that, well, now I cannot use C4 on the two breakable walls without alerting them. Which becomes important later on in the playthrough, because of the stun grenades. Now, when you get back up to the first floor, make sure to give Meryl a call. Which, back in my first playthrough in 99, I just had to find out by trying out all possible frequencies. Because I did not understand the back of the CD case reference. I first thought it had something to do with the optical disc we got from Baker, and when that was obviously not a solution, I thought I had to find something near the computers on the first floor. After all, at this point I did not yet expect Metal Gear to go that far when it comes to breaking the fourth wall. Anyway, after you've contacted Meryl, it will take some time for her to open up the cargo door, so we might as well get some equipment, specifically the suppressor and the cardboard box. Now, as iconic as the cardboard box is, you actually don't really need it at all, but hey, we cannot have a Metal Gear playthrough without it, obviously. And an interesting thing about the cardboard box, by the way, although it's unfortunate that it turns out to have no actual practical use, is that it has a secondary function, and that's why there are three of them. If you hide under one of those boxes in a cargo truck and an enemy sees you, you will be transported to the location written on the specific box you are using. However, I think that this is more or less a remnant of an earlier moment in development, because there is absolutely no practical use for it. In fact, the one location where you would think it would come in handy to quickly traverse a long distance is for getting back to the helipad from the snowfield. But there are no guards in the snowfield, so you cannot even use this trick in the cargo truck in that location. 
So my guess is that this principle simply carried over from the previous game, but they never found an actual practical use for it. That's my guess anyway. Avoiding the lasers will not be much of an issue, especially if you use the thermal goggles instead of the cigarette trick. And after that we have the first boss fight against Vulcan Raven, in other words the fight against the M1 tank. Now I wish I could give you some good tips on the fight against Raven, but it's basically the same as on any other difficulty. And in the end it just comes down to getting a grenade in the right place. And that's tough to do because of the controls. Because you cannot aim your throw and avoid the machine gun or the tank itself at the same time. After all, then you would throw into the direction you are running towards. And on top of that, uh, throwing diagonally is quite awkward to begin with. Furthermore, your throw has to be quite specific and we're dealing with a moving target. A rather unpredictably moving target, especially when the chaff is active. I will not let you pass. Send him a message. <laughs> That's right, you belong on the ground. You should crawl on the ground like the snake you are. Alright, throw a chaff grenade and immediately after the cannon is fired, run towards the tank. You always want to stay close to prevent the tank from using the main cannon again. And then it really comes down to your ability to precisely throw a grenade. The machine gun fire can be avoided by more or less running in a circle, or an arch I should say. But what is more likely to hit you is, well, the tank itself. Since you need to get rather close to throw a grenade, and as you saw, I did get run over. Strangely enough, that hardly does any damage, even on extreme. Now for the second soldier it gets tricky, because you have to throw your grenade rather late. Since he will be blinking at first, meaning that he cannot get hit yet. So you have to throw after he already started firing. So get in position and stay rather close so he's unlikely to hit you. Alright, and that's it for part 1. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. And don't forget the notification bell. And check out my other walkthroughs. And of course, stay tuned for the next episode.